Hi, uh, good afternoon. We are delighted this afternoon to have the presence of Dr. Dean Murhead, who is an adjunct faculty member in the Environmental Science Department at the University of Houston Clear Lake. He is a subject matter expert in the physical, chemical, and biological processes of water and air systems in closed loop life support system in microgravity and partial gravity habitats for human space missions. He is the sole inventor of a NASA patented technology used, used on the International Space Station since 2016 that increased the water recovery from urine from 67% to 87%. He has a PhD in civil and environmental engineering from Louisiana State University. His research interests are in the interaction and impacts of human space exploration on the moon's ambient, water, and carbon cycles. We now give the floor to the distinguished Dr. Dean Muirhead. Thank you, Carlota. Okay, I appreciate everyone being here after, after lunch. Um, and appreciate the conference, it's been great. I've been coming to Mexico since the 1980s, and uh, it's a very special place for me. So I'm, I'm really happy to be here. And thank you for allowing us to speak in, uh, in English, of course. I admire all of you who are bilingual. I, I've studied Spanish and I know it's, I I'm just have nothing but respect for you young people who are learning uh, to, to think and talk and communicate in two languages, so thank you. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the human side of the missions and uh, the life support system and I'm gonna be focusing on water and I'll be talking about the International Space Station. That's our test bed for testing technologies that go into space. And then also comparing that to the lunar missions. Um, I'd like to give a little background. I'm, uh, many of us are here from Houston, of course, the Johnson Space Center. I don't know if any of you have been there. Um, but Texas also now has uh, SpaceX in Brownsville. It's about six hours south of Houston. And we have... Uh, Blue Origin, of course, is up in Seattle. So a lot of our young people have a number of opportunities in a lot of different locations. I just want to emphasize that. We have Margaret is going to be speaking, I think, tomorrow from Goddard. And of course, Kennedy is where we launch, but Johnson Space Center is where the astronauts live and train. Mission Control is there. Um, I think we may have seen this picture before. I'm in Building 7. The moon rocks are just across the parking lot. Uh, from, from our building. Um, this campus was built in the 1960s for the Apollo, 1950s even. Um, and then the, I live in a little community uh, just across the, people don't realize that NASA's on the water, I think, but I live in a community where all the Apollo astronauts lived. So I, in case you're interested, um, Neil Armstrong, the first person to walk on the moon, his house is for sale uh, for, for $550,000 if you'd like to buy it. Uh, what else do I say? So we have um, about 40 active astronauts and a number of interns, of course, too. Um, I'd like to invite you to the Houston Space Center. That's the way to visit as a tourist. Um, we've got the Saturn V, which we showed earlier. Uh, we've got the Apollo 17 capsule that went around the moon and came back. Uh, we've got a mock-up of the International Space Station. We have Mission Control, of course, and we have the old Apollo Mission Control. And um, my daughter drives the tram, so I love to ride the tram. So that takes you to the Building 9 mock-up of the ISS, takes you to the uh, um, Apollo uh, Mission Control as well. We have about a million visitors a year. Um, so a little background on the International Space Station. Um, it's the most expensive single object ever built by humanity. It's in excess of $100 billion. Um, and we spend about 
at least two or more billion dollars per year to support it. It's scheduled to run through 2030, and a lot of private companies are going to be replacing it. Blue Origin plans to do an orbiting uh, habitat, and so do several other companies as well. So low Earth orbit, and it's not that impressive in terms of how far it is. It's only 200 miles above us. Um, but it's where we learn how to design technologies that work in microgravity. And if it works in microgravity, it'll probably work in partial gravity of the planet's surface. Um, it's the only place on Earth that I know of where Russians and Americans live together in peace. We share a lot of hardware. Sometimes we're short on water. Sometimes they're short on food. We actually exchange uh, things and help each other. Uh, and we hope that that continues as the competition for the moon uh, comes upon us. What else do I want to say? Uh, it's about 800 cubic meters of air. It's about like the size of a five-bedroom house. And we currently have seven astronauts there. Um, if I zoom in on the one thing near the airlock where the astronauts go in and out for E, I'm going to use the term EVA quite a bit. That's just a spacewalk, an extra uh, vehicular uh, um, activity. And so um, I'd like to show the mechanical engineers. There's a toolbox on the outside. I want to emphasize that the tools we make, because the astronauts are wearing gloves and a suit, and, and when you wear a suit like the ones that we currently have, it's like playing contact football when you, when you walk in those things. It's not easy at all, especially on a surface. And your gloves, your, your dexterity is not very good with your hands. So when you design tools for astronauts, you want them to be very simple. So I want to emphasize that simple is very important. Right? Da Vinci said simplicity is the ultimate sophistication or something like that. Um, so uh, if you open that up, I always say it's interesting. There's a hammer and a crowbar. And of course, that's in case the, you can't open the door to get back in from your spacewalk. Um, but this idea, too, that we need the whole uh, International Space Station was assembled with these simple tools and just two people going out on an EVA to connect all those nodes together. It's pretty impressive. Uh, result in going from very simple to very complex. So orbiting at 17,000 miles per hour uh, makes a orbit every 90 minutes. So in the, inside the station, I don't have a lot of pictures today. I'm sure you've all looked at some of the videos or, or images of the ISS. I want to emphasize uh, we use a lot of duct tape, right? And so there again, it's it's um, there's always something simple that to fix something that's kind of complicated. Uh, also, there's no reference when you're not looking out the window of what's up and what's down. And so they actually put the lights on, on one of the walls so that they kind of have a reference of what's up and what's down. Whoops. Uh, this is a water recovery system. It's a little complicated. Happy to talk to you more about it. If you're interested in the, the life support systems, it's, uh, we have a lot of mechanical engineers. Um, but yeah, we've got water, we've got air, we've got thermal. Thermal's a big deal on the station. I, did, I forgot to mention in the previous slide, it's hard to dump heat to vacuum, right? You, you can't use conduction, you can't use convection. So you have to radiate the heat. So the ISS has a lot of radiators that radiate the heat to, to deep space as photons. Um, let's see. If we start with the the astronaut, the person, right? I'm going to talk more about the water balance for a person. Um, we have from perspiration and respiration going up in, it's just like a dehumidifier in a house. We condense that water. And, we, and I'll show in a minute, there's a lot of water that goes in the air phase. So in a closed habitat, you learn a lot about um, what's leaving the body because it's always there next to you if you don't do something with it. Um, that gets condensed, and this is the water processor assembly. Um, and then, of course, the crew goes to the loo. Um, I always have questions on the loo. We'll save those for later if we want to talk about that. Um, but the urine goes in and it's distilled with a vacuum distiller. That was my small contribution to uh, the ISS. Um, and then um, we get about 87% of the water goes into the WPA as distillate, distillate and about 13% goes to a brine. And just in the past year, we started dewatering that brine, too. Um, so I'll talk about that briefly. Um, but the, in the WPA, so the condensate and the distillate come together, and that's converted to potable water. The WPA has uh, 
resin beds, like other speakers talked about earlier, and also a catalytic reactor to oxidize the organics. The, uh, the, uh, on the U.S. side, we use iodine as a disinfectant. The Russians use ionic silver. And let's see. We'll go to the next one. So you may have heard it in the news. Um, NASA made a milestone of 98% recovery of water. Um, I'm actually the one who made that calculation. And so um, I, I analyzed the brine when it was returned and calculated how much water was was it left after uh, we dewatered the brine. And um, that number is important because that shows that the ISS has the water recovery needed to, a, to do a Mars transit. So it's, it's, a, pretty big, it's a pretty big deal um, to reach that amount. And I, I want to emphasize we still have a long ways to go. There's still a lot of uh, other places we need to capture the water. Um, I just want to emphasize too, it always seems like NASA knows exactly what they're doing and every, all the experts just figure everything out, but we spend every day figuring things out. And when we first launched the distiller in 2009, um, it immediately plugged up because microgravity is a little tricky. This, this, this distiller too, it has to rotate to separate the water and the air because you can't do that in microgravity. And so um, it has a small pitot tube that plugged up. And um, anyway, that led to my uh, work with the urine team to help develop an alternative to fix that problem. Also, but it is one of the most complicated pieces of the ISS, believe it or not, I would, in, in many people's opinion, uh, the distiller itself. So let's talk about ourselves for a minute. It's something that we take for granted when we're living on Earth, but. Um, you really learn a lot about yourself in a, when you live in a closed habitat with other people. And it's, a, it's pretty like a small habitat too. Um, humans have evolved to conserve water. It doesn't seem like we're very conservative with water, but if you can compare ourselves to other primates, they use a lot more water. If we flew gorillas, they would use almost twice as much water per day as, as humans do. One of our uh, differences is our nose and then our ability to perspire too, of course. But in general, we conserve water, and then the more active you are, the more water you use. Um, so the more active you are, and our astronauts are pretty active, so they use a fair amount of water. We have our astronauts drink a lot of water to prevent kidney stones. Um, and then this is a busy chart too, but I want to emphasize that um, part of this is whatever's leaving your body um, in a closed habitat, it is there next to you if you don't do something about it, right? So. Um, Apart from recovering all that water, you want to handle that, that wastewater. So if we start up here, the other impressive thing, oops, uh, we don't realize it, but we each emit one kilogram of carbon dioxide every day. And so the carbon dioxide levels on station are about 4,000 parts per million. They're about 10 times higher than the ambient here on Earth, which are 400, roughly 600 probably in this room. As we get more people in this room, CO2 levels go up, if, depending on the aeration, of course. Um, so that's a challenge to remove that carbon dioxide. And then um, into the air phase goes about two liters of water. And that's what we call crew latent. So I'll refer to that in a couple of slides as well. Um, that's, where, that's why we have to condense. If we don't condense, things get very humid and then it uh, condenses on all the metal um, hardware. So we can't have that. We keep the humidity right at 50%, right at comfort level both for the humans and for the hardware. And then uh, we mentioned the crew drinks a fair amount of water, so they put out two liters of water. So we've got four liters or four kilograms leaving the body as water. And then the fecal water, we, we actually don't recover that yet. Um, but that's about 0.2 kilograms. It's actually a little higher when you're, more, when you're exercising more and also in microgravity, we think there's a little higher level of water in the fecal matter. But anyway, that's, that number, just keep that in mind, that's two plus two plus 0.2, so 4.2 kilograms of water are leaving the body every day. And the other interesting part that we don't realize, uh, our bodies are making water, right? This reaction down here, organic matter plus oxygen, uh, gives us CO2 and water. So again, I mentioned we're, we're making a kilogram of CO2 every day. It seems like we're doing nothing, but. It, Every day we have 10 kilograms of mass go in and out of our body. And on Earth, it just goes out into nature, into the natural carbon cycle, water cycle. We don't see ourselves as part of the water cycle, right? At least I don't until we're reminded of it. When you think, yeah, it's funny, you have to leave the Earth to appreciate 
what's, what's naturally happening on Earth. Um, and so that we make about, uh, you, if you tell me how many calories you had today, I'll tell me how many water molecules you made. So if I had 3,000 calories, which today I'm pretty sure I'm gonna hit 3,000 calories, uh, then my body made four, 430 grams of water. So whenever we do a real close water balance in a closed habitat, we see this surplus water that we didn't even launch, right? It didn't fly up there as water molecules. Our bodies and bacteria, everybody who's doing oxidation of organics makes this CO2 and water, of course. Anyway, it's kind of uh, interesting. And then uh, we have four crew members, or, or you know, you just multiply all this by four. Uh, and that's what's sitting next to you in your habitat. Um, Okay, so I wanted to sh share a little bit. For those of you who are in biology or interested in um, looking at the literature on this stuff, um, this is one real good document. Uh, this is the baseline values and uh, assumptions document that NASA uses for any mission. It, it talks about all these water numbers that I'm talking in here. It talks about CO2. It talks about hygiene and everything else. Um, and so that, if you just Google that, um, it's, we call it the BVAD. Um, and the most recent version is Mike Ewart 2022. Um, I, I recommend that. Um, but it gives you values for the, the uh, waste streams. And I'll talk about that. It's about the quantities of the waste stream and then the composition of those waste streams as well. Um, hygiene, I forgot to mention. On ISS, we don't, no one has ever had a successful microgravity shower. So they just do sponge baths. They use, they fly several thousand wet wipes each year. And so they use a lot of wet wipes and uh, they wet towels and things like that. But um, they don't have any, they don't use very much water, less than, des definitely less than half a liter of water for hygiene. And which is interesting because they're exercising two to three hours a day. Um, and so they do have quite a bit of sweat. Um, the urine, we're, we're doing a good job of recovering that, but there's other technologies and options for recovering urine. And then laundry, we've never had a laundry uh, on the station either. So all the clothes are worn until you can't wear them anymore. Uh, so those, when, whenever I mention these gaps, these are always opportunities uh, for, for young people to figure this out. Um, this I, I think is interesting. This is kind of, like I said, everything that's coming off the body ends up next to you. And it's the same with all of our emissions, our gas emissions. So the kilogram of CO2 is, a lot of that goes into the water, into the humidity condensate, because it's soluble, right? Um, and then the other thing that's interesting is the ammonia. So this x-axis is the concentration in our, when we condense the water, the molecules, the small molecules that leave our body, um, in addition to the water molecules, that water is fairly clean, but it does have these organics. And who loves organics? Uh, small organics, bacteria do, right? So. Uh, we have a real challenge, and we don't have any microbiological uh, bioreactor systems on ISS. Um, but anyway, ammonia and, and CO2 enter the, the condensate. We also have some other compounds. I, I, I kind of showed this to, it's interesting because if you compare this to the volatiles on the moon, they're very similar. I highlighted the ones that are the same for the human body and for the moon, carbon dioxide, methane, uh, the human body puts out about 500 mi uh, milligrams a day of, of methane. Um, what else? Methanol and methane. Uh, yeah, this is interesting. That's the same uh, uh, volatiles we saw uh, from the uh, plume that we talked about earlier in another uh, paper. Um, so again, for testing um, the hardware, we have to make a simulated uh, waste stream, right? So. Uh, for the humidity condensate, we make uh, the waste stream based on the compounds that we measure in the return condensate. Um, and similar, urine, we tend to recommend using real urine, um, just because urine is a very complex matrix um, and very biologically active. Um, and so I wanted to give you one more reference, too. For all the papers on life support, we have a conference every year. We have student uh, posters. I recommend you... Uh, starting to think about doing that. This coming year is going to be in Louisville, Kentucky. It, our conference was in Calgary, Canada a month ago. It's usually in July. Um, but all, the nice thing about that conference is all the papers are published as downloadable PDFs. And so that's at, it's at Texas Tech University, but if you Google Texas Tech University, and there's the URL there. 
Um, you can research by author and, uh, and subject as well. So anything you're interested in about water and life support, air for white, uh, life support, and the suits are, the uh, EVA suits are really complex. So we have sessions on the suits as well. Um, so in transitioning from the ISS experience to the moon, um, there's a lot of differences. And so that's why there's still a lot of gaps to figure out in, uh, in the lunar missions. We call the lunar missions notional because we haven't figured them out ourselves yet. Um, one of the differences is that num we talked about the in situ stuff in a lot of the other papers, right? Those are gonna require a lot of EVAs or spacewalks. And so on ISS, we don't do many spacewalks. Um, it's very infrequent. And so that's gonna be a challenge. It's a big deal when you walk out the door into space vacuum. You wanna, your suits only last about eight hours, right? You've gotta have O2 supply, you gotta have CO2 removal during those eight hours. You gotta have the water removal because they get uh, con the, a lot of uh, water vapor. And uh, your batteries tend to last about eight hours as well. So all those things converge on, uh, on uh, limiting your spacewalks. Uh, what else we have? No lunar dust. Lunar dust is an issue that we're concerned about bringing it into the habitat. Uh, is going to be an issue p possibly, or how to keep it out of the habitat, I should say. And, oh, and the other one is dormancy. Like on ISS, they're it's been continuously uh, lived in since 2000 on the U.S. segment, so um, that actually makes things simple. You think about it, if you have a in our lunar missions, we're planning to visit for 30 days or so, or even less, and then come back the next year. And so similar with Mars. So there's these dormant periods where your hardware has to stay uh, stable. If you, turn your, if you leave your house for a year, right, and you come back, you turn things on. Um, sometimes things don't work that well when they're in dormant periods. So the coming decades are going to be interesting. Um, and so we've got um, basically the US and their partners and China and their partners. And if you look at these objectives and goals, they're pretty much identical. Um, the Chinese have a, right now there's 10 people in space orbiting us above, seven in the ISS and three in the Chinese space station. And, um, and then they both have plans to go to the moon and, and build a orbiting, uh, similar to the ISS, an orbiting station around the moon as well. Um, and they both plan to explore the, the southern Pole as well. Um, and of course, uh, um, one of the main goals of Artemis 3 is to put the first woman on the moon, right? And so it, to me, it's still interesting. To me, it's still an open question on who that first woman will be, if she'll be an American or, you know, or, or from China, basically. It's going to be an interesting uh, thing to watch. The Chinese have caught up in many aspects very, very rapidly. Um, and, and in part, that's a, that's a good thing um, that inspired uh, the U.S. That competition has inspired, inspired the U.S. in the early days, of course. Um, so the in-situ folks have probably mentioned this. The, the classic paper is 1961. Kenneth Watson, he was 40 at the time. And so knowing, I'm a curious type. So he's the one who said that the, the polar regions of the moon will probably have ice because the, the vapor pressure of ice is so small uh, that you won't have water molecules escaping from those dark regions that are the coldest in the solar system. And so me being curious, I googled his name, and I want us all to celebrate his birthday tomorrow. Uh, he was born in 1921, he's still alive. He got an award like last year, um, and I, I checked <laughs> since he'll be 102 tomorrow. So. Um, I was just impressed that, so this is a good field to get into. It's gonna keep you young and healthy, I'd, I would say. But uh, I was impressed that uh, he's still alive. He's from Cal Berkeley, or Cal, in, Cal Tech, I'm sorry. Um, now as far as um, looking at missions that uh, we can utilize for the Artemis human missions on the surface of the moon, Apollo 17, and I, I was glad to see that Ryan uh, brought up Apollo 17. Apollo 17 was remarkable, 1972, um, this is before the internet, this is before computers basically, right? And they did an extensive number of spacewalks, they collected a huge amount of uh, rocks and brought them back that, that Ryan talked about earlier. Um, and so I calculated the percent of time the crew spends on the EVA. And so for, the, for, that, art, for that Apollo 17, it was uh, 5%. And, um, 
and yet on ISS, it's less than 0.3% of the time they spend out in spacewalks. So again, this idea of spacewalks are not easy, and that's going to be a huge challenge for the lunar missions. Okay, and then just, I have a real quick summary of uh, comparing the, uh, I didn't come to realize how complicated the lunar missions are going to be on the surface until I put together this real simple simulation. Uh, but if we look at ISS, it's, uh, it's just, you know, in our case, seven people in the U.S. segment. There's one German up there with us right now. Uh, and usually, and sometimes it's Japanese. Um, and then there's usually three Russian uh, cosmonauts up there with us. But anyway, that's microgravity. But the thing is, it's all in one uh, habitat, right? It's, it simplifies things. Now, in the lunar missions, we're going to have a mobile crew. They're going to be, one day they're going to be in the rover. One day they're going to be in a pressurized rover or a, in their suits in the in the lunar terrain vehicle, they're wearing their suits, and then they're in the habitat, and then that's not even to mention ascent and descent uh, from, from either an orbiting platform or from Earth. Um, the neat thing about all these missions, um, and Kenneth Watson reminds us of this, he's, he's 102, most of you will be living to, to at least 2100 if you were born around 2000, you're gonna be living close to the, the age of 100, so you get to see what transpires in space, not to mention the interesting things that happen on Earth as well. Um, but what I want to point out for, for, for today at least, uh, the crew of four is what we're kind of planning on for the surface missions and in pairs. And so one pair will be out on EVA, one pair will be in the pressurized rover or in the habitat. Um, and then as you got a, a little bit of taste of where are they going to be? They're not going to be on the plains. They're going to be on the edge of craters and things. It's going to be a real challenging terrain, um, very physically demanding. And that's because that's where the water is. It's, it's larger than the Grand Canyon, right? The um, Shackleton's uh, crater is one, one option. So it's going to be real interesting. The other thing I think that's going to be neat in, these, in the Artemis missions, unlike Apollo, we're going to have as close to a live feed as possible, people wearing GoPros. And then, to me, the most amazing thing is the view of Earth from the moon. Um, if you think about when you look at a full moon, how big it is, well, Earth is four times bigger than the moon. So picture something four times bigger than the full moon. And then Earth is three times brighter than the moon. The moon looks pretty bright to me, but Earth's albedo, albedo is about three times bigger. So picture something four times bigger and uh, three times brighter. And that's the way the, the, we, the Earth looks like from the moon. It doesn't give it um, justice in a lot of the pictures that we see of the, moon, of the Earth. So if I quickly um, assess the mission on the surface of the moon, this is what the water, all these different waters, each one of these waters needs a tank and you have to manage it. I got the clean water at the top of the list and the dirtier water at the bottom of the list, but that dirty water has to become clean water and then on the lunar missions, that's going to be challenging in the short term. So our short-term short missions, we're deciding on when can we recover the water and when, when do we have to store it for longer, uh, like when we come back the following year. Um, and then if we look at, so that's the ISS. That's complicated enough. Um, but then we, if we, for the lunar missions, we have the pressurized rover in addition. We have uh, a, the suits and the... Uh, another lunar terrain vehicle where they can get in and out of the vehicle quickly to go explore for water. Um, so this just shows you the, all the different water streams that we're going to have to manage and keep track of. And then not to mention that the whole point of this is to look for water in the, in the uh, regolith. And there's a very small amount of water in the uh, lith what we call the lithosphere. When its atmosphere is real thin, it's a lithosphere. And um, there's only about one water molecule, or some people think more than that, per, per cubic centimeter. Um, so if I simulate this, and then this is more for the engineers, but all these water streams come from the hardware. So the condensation, the humidity condensate, that water comes from the condensers. So the surfaces of our condensers, sometimes they're met metal, and they have they uh, leach zinc and other things. So that. Uh, we have to kind of know what the hardware is that's producing the, the condensate as well. Uh, so there's a lot of things to keep track of. And, and then you have to coordinate this, right? You have to coordinate the hardware with the, weight, the water treatment as well. So you, you have to communicate with each other and other groups. Um, let's see, what else do I say that? And then, yeah, I don't, 
try and refrain from using the word toilet, but the toilet's an important part of this water recovery system. Uh, wherever we go, we're gonna have urine, and we're gonna have humidity condensate, and we're gonna have fecal matter. And th that's another place where we're not recovering the water yet is the fecal matter. Um, so in my simple comparison of ISS and the, and the lunar mission, um, we've got the waste streams, the quantities and the composition, which I've talked about a little bit. We call those air sots when we make up a, a wastewater uh, just from adding chemicals to the water. And then, what, but what's new about the lunar missions is the locations um, and the crew mo moving from one place to another. And so that water, uh, that human water cycle is following them wherever they go. Even when they're in their suit, they're still going to lose those 4.2 kilograms per day of water. And so that becomes the challenge. Um, I think I showed this a little bit earlier. This is the water balance for, for the crew. Remember, the other interesting decision we have to make, for those of you, we just had uh, dinner up at this, the school upstairs here. The food packages have a, like 40% water in them. And, we, and so that water is part of the water balance and it gets a little tricky. And for these longer missions, keeping food stable for a year or two is a real challenge as well. Uh, some people are saying the crew's not gonna be real thrilled about the quality of the the, the food. And also, I forgot to mention, we have a hot water in our potable water. We have a hot water. They say that that's one thing that the crew really wants is uh, it makes a huge difference for them if they have hot water, both for coffee and, and just heating up food and things. Um, so, yeah, again, this idea that 3.7, this is kilograms of water going into the body. The body makes the 0.4 kilograms and then coming out is 4.2 kilograms and, and it ends up in the urine, the condensate, and in the fecal water. Um, rem remind you too, the air sets recipes, uh, I, gave, I gave earlier, sorry. Um, but those, a lot of those are available uh, in the BVAD as well. Um, Okay, so now let's, let's just quickly follow the crew through a 30-day mission. Now, this is uh, probably a decade or two away at least, right? Um, this is like Artemis 7 and beyond is when we start to establish those 30-day missions on the surface of the moon. Um, let's see. This is another reference I used, but let's, again, I'm assuming a crew of four, and the other opportunity here is hygiene. Um, because of the lunar dust, because of the high activity of the crew on the lunar surface, they're probably gonna need more extensive hygiene. And, and also we don't have like a, to wash dishes and things on the ISS. So those are all opportunities. They sound like simple mundane things, but the simple mundane things are what people normally forget about and wait till the last minute to, th to think about. So it's fun to think about them now. Uh, so here's on the x-axis is the 30 days and the amount of time the crew of four is split between these different things. So the first week they spend in a habitat, a surface habitat, and then the things get interesting in the middle weeks. The red is the EVAs and the yellow is the pressurized rover. So we have to decide too on what goes into that pressurized rover. And so each, it's going to have to have a toilet as well and so you're going to have to be uh, both storing and figuring out what to do with this, all these waste streams, not to mention provide potable water and food in each of these platforms as well. Um, so here I track the amount of time. So they spend 88 crew member days in the ha habitat. They spend 28 crew member days in the pressurized rover. And then they spend uh, four crew member days total in their suits. And then if we look at where the water goes, well, the water, of course, follows that same pattern of habitats. Uh, and so in the, in the case of my simple 2 plus 2 plus 0.2 model, right, it's a, the amount of urine is the same as the amount of condensate. And so um, that water is distributed, and that stays in the habitat. Um, now I'm going to talk a little bit more about the, uh, the, the suits. The suits are interesting for a couple reasons, um, partly because the current technology, the state of art in suits, um, you need to have cooling, especially when you're in sunlight. Now, in, when you're in the dark, it gets a little more complicated. But in general, you still have to dump heat from the, the body is like 100 watt of energy of light bulb. And so, um, especially when you're exercising, you're developing a lot of heat. And so, um, 
that water, that would be a water loss if we don't increase or change our suit technology. So we have companies working on other ways. Now, evaporating water is the, the way the current suits cool the suit. And you're losing that water. In this case, it would be complicated because you'd be uh, em emitting it to the exosphere and the lithosphere. You would, I think there might be some science opportunities to trace that water, but in general, you don't want to dump water when you're trying to look for water for scientific reasons as well as mine it eventually. So it could complicate things if we don't get those newer suit technologies. Um, and then the, even our condensate, all those organic molecules I talked about, those two are currently emitted to outside of the suit. And so uh, the suits become a critical part of the future missions for Artemis, obviously. There's other ways to do it, radiative cooling and heat exchangers, but those are in low uh, technology readiness levels. Um, this is just an example of, this is what we would start with at the initial before the 30 days gets going. And then, uh, and then we, at the end we would, have, uh, we would have our humidity condensate in the surface rover, urine in the surface habitat, and in the pressurized rover, uh, anyway. And then we see a little bit, 51 kilograms of metabolic water was made. Um, and then this summarizes the mass of things, but you, you think about this, all this mass has to be managed and tracked and taken care of. Uh, and if we go to hygiene, full hygiene is significantly amount more water than if we just use the ISS uh, surface wiping uh, hygiene practices. Uh, so hygiene is a tricky one to figure out. I think that's... Uh, Almost did, I want to summarize. So ISS is obviously our test bed. The problem is if you don't use technologies that were tested on ISS, you're always opening yourself up to new risks. So there's um, a real um, impetus to test the technologies as best we can on the ISS uh, before, like, you kind of don't want to just put them on the moon and see if they work in the, in the partial gravity habitat. Um, and the moon has got a lot of new challenging things. I tried to highlight things here in the summary, just things for you to think about uh, going forward. Um, the, the requirements are changing, so it's important to keep up with them. Uh, I mentioned hygiene. I didn't talk too much about the simple technologies, low mass, uh, easy to fix, all those things are in play in this case. And, and then another place, a good niche for small companies is contingency, right? If our big water processor goes down, uh, if you have a simple filter process to act as a contingency for the big system, uh, it doesn't have to be complicated, but that's what the crew could switch to, especially for the Mars Transits missions. And storing water. And so thank you very much for your time. I know it's a tough time, time slot for us, so I appreciate you... Uh, powering through this with me. Thank you. Well, we thank Dr. Dean Muirhead. Now we have a few minutes for some questions. So, well, now. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Muirhead. Uh, what are the main trade-offs and challenges involved in, in designing this uh, life, closed loop life support systems for human missions? Can you elaborate? Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's funny. Um, even with ISS, I don't think people realize um, the amount of uh, effort that goes in on ISS. Every day there's 20 problems that come up on ISS. And we have uh, mission control, and then behind mission control, there's another room. And that's where the engineers are, too. But in real time, either the crew solves it or uh, other people do. But I think it's in the, the little thing. A big thing that we're focused on, especially for Mars Transit, is how many spares do we take with us? And the moon and Mars, it's a little hard to, uh, ISS is easy to resupply, and there's a lot of spares on ISS. And also, the technologies being modular helps. Um, like our old oxygen generation system from water was, it was hard to replace one, one part, you have to take out the whole thing. And the new, the, what we're calling the new technology is exploration. 
so exploration oxygen generation system. And that one is a little easier to repair. Um, now, in water, our, our mantra is, for the water team, it's nobody dies of thirst. And so there's a little bit less pressure for the water team. Uh, but now the air team, especially, I think the suit is the real, uh, it's a big deal to do a spacewalk. And so on the moon, it's going to be a big deal to do long-term spacewalk. Not to mention, if they're doing physical activities, uh, either mining or looking for water eventually. But um, pretty much anything you can imagine uh, is, a, is a, a challenge. And we don't hear about those because uh, we don't, when everything's nominal, we don't hear about it. Yeah. Um, first of all, thank you for coming here. Um, there is one question which I had. Um, as an engineering student, I have to think about um, practicality and efficiency. And I have to ask, all of these technologies, is there, has there been any try to normalize them among different nations? Thank you. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah I have the same question. In fact, I, I, you know, when I think of my career too, I've never enjoyed more than working with the Russian engineers. And so that lack of, I mean, it's, it's, it's an interesting, we live in interesting times now, right? Um, but yeah, I think, um, I think it's an opportunity for collaboration. And I would like to have you young people figure it out for us, right? But um, if we have a common goal, um, whatever it is. Now, I think the lunar missions, too, uh, offer an opportunity. Like, I think if both China and the US are on, and of course um, other countries are on the lunar surface and there's a problem in one of the habitats, I'm sure there's movies about this, but you, you can't not help the other folks, right? And so this idea of living in extreme environments, we're gonna have to collaborate, I think, at some point. And, 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 the, and maybe the decision not to fight each other on, a, on other planets is easier than, than when we're living on, on the Earth. But anyway, that's, I, be, I turn into philosophical, uh, that's a great, a great question, and I, I guess I throw it back to you all. Uh, I would love to hear your ideas on how we do that, both, both far away and, and here on the planet, right? Yeah. Well, first of all, thank you, doctor, for all the information. It was pretty valuable. And I have a two-part question. The first part would be like, what would happen if an astronaut, when he or she sweats, what happens with all the water that goes into the helmet, like to the visor part? Because I believe that it can go and stick to the visor. And that's the first part. And the second one, uh, if astronauts do have a system to pee or to have any like, uh, fecal uh, matters or pee inside the suit. Thank mm -hmm. you. Yes, thank you, thank you. Uh, your second part distracted me. I, I'm trying to remember your first question. Uh, oh, the visor, yeah, yeah, thanks, thanks. Yeah, we've had problems with the water in the visor. That emphasizes how much water our bodies are putting out. So we've kind of redesigned the insides of that uh, helmet to absorb some water. And then also there's a huge, you don't realize it, but there's a huge airflow in that suit that's sweeping away the water and evaporating it off too. So we've made a few improvements, but that's, that's one of the scary parts of the suit. They really rely on clean water too. Uh, and um, so if you let a suit sit around for a while, it can grow bacteria and things. Um, the second part too, that's another, th and this is an emphasis that uh, we're still figuring things out every day there's something new to figure out and that's what makes this field interesting right because i don't think you all want a, a kind of job where you just don't have to th think about solving a problem but anyway um the uh we, we've debated whether or not to have we call it a maximum absorbency garment or a diaper basically in the suit and i did actually i did a study on that if if they wear a mag and then there is a contingency plan they go in their suit and they have to stay in their suit for six days there's an emergency, they have to come back to Earth, they have six days to come back to Earth, 
if they're in their suit for the six days, I calculated that uh, if they wear a diaper, they will actually die from the ammonia coming off the urine. Um, and so um, <laughs> I, I, that's my idea for a movie script, I guess. But, um, but so actually currently they thinking of not wearing a diaper, just let the urine flow through uh, in the case of the EVAs. But I think for the shorter EVAs, since you're not, you can change out afterwards, you, they're wearing a mag, a maximum absorbency garment. Last question, please. Yes. Well, hello. Um, first of all, thank you for being here. It's a pleasure for all of us to have you here in our college. Um, well, in your presentation, there is a thing that catch my attention as a medicine student here in UPAEP. Mm -hmm. um, what's the difference between metabolism water and human body water uh, that they use for all that you explain about? Sure. I think you can probably uh, explain it to me better. Yeah, so I mean, like, there's 40 liters, 40 kilograms, 50 kilograms of water in my body right now, right? And, um, and urine is just filtered blood, too. But um, now the metabolic water, that's just an, that's the amazing thing about the human body, right? And, and those of you in biology understand it way better than I do. Every single cell has that reaction going on. The organics are getting oxidized by oxygen, and they're making water molecules in every single cell. And then the body miraculously moves that water around. If I decide to eat 10 grams of salt today, my body just handles it. And it keeps that perfect water balance. Um, and so the metabolic water is just the, the molecules of water that are being made from the oxidation of organic, the food that we eat. And then the body water is that other reservoir. I don't know if that's related to your question or not, but, but yeah. And that's directly related to how many calories you're eating for the metabolic water. Well, thank you, I wanna, I wanna add one thing too. I'm, a, I'm an extreme introvert. And so for the introverts in the audience, please come talk to me afterwards. I was at a conference up in Canada, like I mentioned, the, the head conference person said that they were a deep introvert. And so I went up and talked to him after the, his talk as well. So um, anyway, I wanted to point that out, that you're, you're all were fortunate that I got to talk to you. But I look forward to talking to you all uh, beyond this meeting. Well, thank you very much, and thank you. Thank uh, you. Yes, <laughs> we are truly grateful for your presence here. Uh, we are excited because we get to do this kind of stuff uh, for the first time, and getting to do it with speakers of a lot of experience, a lot of 